encouraging songs. Um, oh, Holy Night is one of my favorite songs of all time. I remember standing underneath a dark sky with very little light pollution at Christmas, on Christmas Eve in Afghanistan, looking up at the stars and singing that song. And it wasn't a, a pretty thing to hear, I'm sure, but it was clear, just looking up at, at the heavens and, and thinking of that special night several millennia ago in which God sent His Son to become one of us, to know us, to guide us and lead us, and to give Himself for us so that we could know Him. This morning, the title of the sermon is Prepare Him Room, Christ Has Come to Give Us Hope. And we're going to be looking at the same text as we looked at last week when Pastor Travis preached a sermon called Prepare Him Room, Christ Has Come to Bring Us peace. So the word hope is not actually mentioned anywhere in these 21 verses we're going to be reading together, but I believe that it's lurking right underneath the surface, implicit throughout this great story. So if you would turn to Luke chapter 2, and if you're reading in the Pew Bible, it's on page 857. I'm going to start in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him on a manger, in a manger, because there was no place for them at the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the flock, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told him. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days... When he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Let's uh, bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, your ways are so much higher than ours. You would reveal this most important message in the history of the universe to lowly and cast out shepherds sitting on a a hillside in a backwater of this earth proclaiming the gospel that you were becoming flesh, that God the Son was coming to dwell with us and that he could be found in an animal stall a mile or so away, laying in a stable. 
We thank you, God, for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the incarnation that you are not just a God who is far away, but you are an omnipotent God who is near to us. And I pray that you would bring us help during our time of need and bring us hope during this, this season in which we remember the incarnation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What are you looking forward to most this Christmas? And be honest, okay? <laughs> My son has his hands raised, hand raised up. Um, what are you looking forward to, Timmy? Presents. That's what I had written down. How did I know? Mothers, what are you looking forward to most this Christmas? Maybe it's actually having some kids back in town. Um, having your family all together. Uh, maybe, for, maybe it's been a while since that's happened. Um, dads, guys, what are you looking forward to? Maybe it's Star Wars? <laughs> Be honest. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But um, I know that some of you in this room are more spiritual than to really be interested in Star Wars, um, a silly movie like that. But, you know, confession time, um, I'm kind of excited to go see it. Uh, when I was a kid, I had the coolest toy, this Millennium Falcon, you know. And so I was flying through the galaxy fighting the bad guys right there with, with Han Solo and Chewbacca. So when I was watching the preview to this movie that's coming up, or I guess it's out there now, um, and I saw... Han and Chewie there once again, after 30-something years of fighting the bad guys, I was excited. And then I got the look from my wife, and it was, you know, kind of, yeah, right, right. Kids, it's not real. Um, But it's exciting. And, you know, um, what I want to tell you this morning is that, as excited as some of you might be about a movie, you know, a story, our story is better. Okay? Our, Our story is better. I mean, in every way, okay? There's some elements, and the the greatest elements in Star Wars, frankly, they stole from our story, okay? Um, You know, good versus evil, uh, the underdog having to fight against this, you know, great empire, so to speak. Um, But think about it. Um, Our story is better. I mean, Obi-Wan Kenobi wouldn't stand a chance if he had to go up against Elijah, you know? I mean, he's got his lightsaber. Elijah's got fire from heaven. Okay, and this whole concept of the force, right? You know, this kind of pantheistic idea that you can tap into this kind of life force that exists all around us. It's not really personal. Holds no candle to the Holy Spirit who lives inside of the Christian, who is knowable and who leads and guides us and gives us power to resist and fight against darkness and is slowly, slowly overcoming the power of darkness in this world today as people come to hear the gospel message and repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, um, on opening day, the Star Wars film here in our own country netted over $120 million. Okay, and it's on on track right now to be the highest grossing film probably of all time. One reviewer said this. He said, Star Wars is American mythology at its finest, bringing a new hope when the world needs heroes. I just want to kind of say to that guy, um, kids, spoiler alert, it's not real, okay? Uh, Disney's CEO came out and he said, hey, this is the most successful mythology of our time with global interest. And two weeks ago, or less than that, I guess a week ago, uh, Time Magazine came out, the December 4th copy, 14th copy, and it's got the little soccer ball um, droid on the front cover. What's his name, kids? BB-8. Thanks, Tim. So, BBA, and there, the, in this article, basically, it's, I don't know, eight or nine pages talking about Star Wars. And there were pictures of Germans wearing stormtrooper costumes walking, like a month ago, you know, walking through parks. I mean, people all around the world are super excited about Star Wars. And so, the author is kind of asking that question, what is it? What is this universal appeal to a story? And, you know, he he goes through and talks about all kinds of stuff. The fact that it's not like an Apple store kind of universe where everything's sanitary and clean, but it's a dusty universe that we can kind of relate with. And so we we see ourselves in that that story. And at the the very end, the author says this, and, and he's actually interviewing somebody who worked on the film. 
And she says, I talked to J.J. Abrams, the guy who made this movie, and said, what is that feeling that everybody has? It isn't hysteria. It's a real intensity. It has a euphoria. But what is it? Everyone has clearly such a love for this, but what is it? And J.J.'s response was, it's hope. People everywhere long for hope. The world defines hope as a feeling that what is wanted will happen. Okay, you know, maybe there's blue skies around the corner. For the Christian, hope is the confidence that what God has done for us in the past guarantees our participation in what God will do in the future. So hope is based on God's promises. John Piper said the word hope in ordinary English vocabulary is generally distinguished from certainty. We would say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I hope this happens. When you read hope in the Bible, like in 1 Peter 1, 13, that says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hope is not wishful thinking. It's not, I don't know if it's going to happen. I hope it happens. That's absolutely not what is meant by Christian hope. Christian hope is when God has promised something that's going to happen, and you put your trust in that promise. Christian hope is a confidence that something will come to pass because God has promised that it will come to pass. So let's go back to our story in Luke chapter 2. As we consider that story together this morning, where do you see hope in this story? And I just want to repeat again, kids, this story is better than any of the stories in Star Wars. Okay? And by the way, I hope I haven't gotten in trouble with any parents. Um, Kids, if your parents say you're too young to go see the movie, they're wise. Listen to them. Okay? Um, Honor your father and mother that your days may be long on this earth. So where do you see your hope in the story? Luke chapter 2. Okay? Uh, And let's just consider it. I'm going to kind of walk through this story with you. A long time ago, in our own galaxy, here on planet Earth, there were a few social outcasts, a few shepherds, sitting on a lonely hillside outside the town of Bethlehem, a place that they still called the city of David. The evil Roman Empire dominated most of the known world, straining them with cruel taxes and nailing anybody who would dare to resist their imperial power to wooden crosses. Tough, tough times. People in this backwater of Israel talked of a time when theirs had been a great independent country, when prophets like Moses and great kings like David led them underneath the mighty hand of God. Sometimes the shepherds told each other stories of times long past when God had done amazing things like parting the Red Sea and when David the shepherd boy had gone up against and slain the giant Goliath. The rabbis still whispered about a promised one that would come and bring deliverance from oppression. But these stories seemed like myths from long ago. God had been silent for hundreds of years. Suddenly, a heavenly messenger showed up, appeared before them, and God's glory shone around them. And the shepherds did what others before them had done when angels showed up. They put their hands in the air... And they screamed. Now let me, pause, let me pause the button here for a minute with our story. And let's kind of enter in a little bit of imagination here. So kids, this isn't in the text, okay? Um, but imagine a scene in heaven, all right? So you've got the, the angel Gabriel and Michael having a little conference. And they're discussing something really important. God has just given them an assignment to go declare the most important news in history to some shepherds in this backwater of uh, Bethlehem that God himself had just been born as a human being and the Savior, the long-awaited Messiah, had come. 
And so they're talking about it, but their problem is people normally freak out when they show up. So Gabriel's saying, I think it ought to be you. And Michael's like, no way, man. You know, I've got, you know, whenever I turn up, they just, they're on the ground, okay? Gabriel's, that's right. You know, you've got, you've got some mighty big muscles. And my problem is that, you know, I've got this Shekinah glory kind of shining off me. I try to cloak it, but they freak out. I mean, um, you know, this guy, Zachariah, you know, Holy of Holies, just a few months back in human time, on earth time, um, freaked out. Of course, then uh, the guy had enough gumption to actually question what I was telling him. I mean, he had a rope tied around his ankle, and he was there in the Holy of Holies, and yet he asked me for a sign, so I had to kind of mute him for a couple months, you know. Um, so they're talking about who's the best to do this. So they call this other angel uh, over, and I'll just call him Harry. Um, kids, I don't know if there are any angels really named Harry, but it's possible. Millions of angels, lots of names, they all have personalities. So they call Harry, and, you know, come here, we've got a job for you. Yes, sir. Uh, why, why me, sir? Well, you're kind of an ordinary dude, and here's the deal. You've got this message that you need to communicate to these shepherds, and the thing is, you've got to do your best to kind of cloak it. Um, don't get the message wrong, okay? Uh, they've got to go to Jerusalem, and they've got to go find the baby Jesus and make him known, okay? And, uh, and Harry says, got it. Uh, we'll try not to uh, scare him too much. Bends his wing, shoots into warp speed, or however fast angels travel when they're flying through interplanetary or interdimensional space travel, and he shows up. Okay, so back to the story. So now it's Harry standing there, you know, and the first thing out of his mouth is what? What what angels always say to people when they show up? Do not be afraid. You know, settle down. Do not be afraid. And he's trying to stay on script. He says, I have good news of great joy for you. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, I don't know what was going through these, 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 these shepherds' minds, but can you imagine, all right? Um, the Creator, Yahweh God, the, the one who did all the miracles they had heard of, the one who is omni everything, you know, omnipotent, omniscient, all power in the universe is now in the form and contained God the Son in a little baby. Uh, It's a mystery that confounds the greatest scholars. Was God the Son who we read about later, who is the, not only the creator, but the sustainer of the universe, right? The logos, the, the origin of the word, the origin of all language. Was he laying there as a helpless babe still maintaining the order of the universe? And how is it that he would come and and learn to speak? Being that he invented all language. He created the periodic table, and yet did he have to learn not to touch the fire? Things that, frankly, are too wonderful for us to fully comprehend. And yet, Harry continues, This will be your sign... You will find this baby wrapped in strips of cloth lying in an animal feeding trough. So the angels had told Harry, we're going to try to keep these, um, these shepherds from freaking out too quick. So it's just you at first, then give us the signal. So he snaps his fingers or whatever. And the entire sky lights up with an army of angels singing, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. For these shepherds, we don't know how long this went on, okay, this, this celestial display of, of glory, um, maybe just a few minutes that probably felt like a lifetime for them. But it's done, angels have, have, have finished their job, and, you know, boom, it just says they went back to heaven, whatever that meant or looked like. And so these disheveled shepherds now look at each other quickly And they decide, hey, we need to, let's go see what this is all about. Let's go to Bethlehem and find this baby, this incredible thing that the Creator has revealed to us. And so they run to Jerusalem. They find the Holy Family, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. And then they run from house to house, making Him known to everyone, to everybody who would listen. Our Savior has come. That's their response. To make Him known. To say, wake up. Our Savior has come. And the text says that everybody was amazed. 
Now, somehow they had slept through the celestial, you know, I don't know how God did it. Um, you know, how, did, how, how come not everybody saw this amazing thing? God may have only opened the shepherd's eyes to see this other dimension for a moment. But, but the, everybody is amazed that the little town is talking, and yet Mary holds her little baby, looking down on, on baby Jesus, treasuring these things in her heart, wondering how God is going to save the world through her son. Hope is a central theme throughout Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Paul wrote, So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And that is true. I mean, love, and it goes on in, in, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, and he talks about it in the first, you know, the first 12 verses of chapter 13, all about what love is. Okay, and so we know love is, is huge, and we know that faith is huge. But let's not forget about the meat in the sandwich, right? The, the, I mean, that's important as well, um, this whole concept of hope. Um, hope is really faith in the future tense. In the Old Testament, God alone was the ultimate ground and object of hope. Hope in God was generated by his mighty deeds in history. In fulfilling his promise to Abraham, God redeemed Israel from bondage in Egypt. He provided for their needs in the wilderness, formed them into a covenant community at Sinai, and he led them into a successful occupation of Canaan. These acts provided a firm base for Israel's confidence in God, continuing, uh, in God's continuing purpose for them. But even when Israel was unfaithful, hope was not lost. Because of God's faithfulness and mercy, those who returned to him could count on his help. Um, We're going to look at just two passages here from the Old Testament. They're printed in your bulletin, so you don't have to turn there. Um, Psalm 130, 7 through 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful love. Redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. In Lamentations 3, 21 through 26, we read, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel's hope was squarely placed on the coming Messiah, the anointed ruler from David's line. That's what we're celebrating this Christmas, that the Messiah has come. Uh, The New Testament writers speak of Jesus Christ as the object and ground for our hope. In 1 Peter 1.3, Peter opens his letter by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Does that hope live in your heart this morning? Titus 3, 4 through 7, Paul writes, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The hope of eternal life is the living hope in our hearts. No matter how difficult this life becomes, our ultimate hope is truly in the next. That's why David, or not David, I'm sorry, that's why Paul wrote, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's almost like he can't wait to die. I I had a buddy who I used to ask him sometimes, "How, how are you doing? And often he would tell me, Troy, I just can't wait to die. Sounds a little morbid, but his point was, I just can't wait to, to be with Christ and to be done with the suffering in this life. And yet, this life is a test that God has given us, 
And the next life is what gives this one the meaning that we have as, as Christians. Not only do we have the hope of eternal life in our hearts, but even in getting through the hardships of this life, we have the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, in our hearts. We have not been left alone to plod through life's trials. In Romans 5, 1 through 5, um, uh, we see a theme that Pastor Travis taught last week about obtaining peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In, in Romans 5, 2, Paul continues, Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. In other translations, like the New American Standard Version, translates that last phrase, and hope does not disappoint. Your hope in Christ will not disappoint because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. No matter how tough things get. Given this assurance of hope, Christians live in the present with confidence and we face the future with courage. Our final hope for the world is in the return of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is not only the hope for you or me. And it's possible to kind of live that way where we're like, you know, beam me out of here, Scotty. It's all going to burn. Okay? Okay. Um, but Christ is the hope for the world. In Titus 2, 11 through 13, Paul wrote, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is our hope as Christians for our world, that one day Christ is going to return. He is going to make all things new. He is going to eradicate the curse of sin. And this world, this, this, this new heaven and new earth that we, we look forward to, will be a place in which our destiny is secure, and the, the purpose for which we've been made is realized, truly honoring and glorifying Him forever. And it is going to be awesome. So, this Christmas, as you prepare room in your hearts for Jesus, I'd like to leave you with three thoughts, and I'll be brief. Number one, Christian, put your hope in Christ. This Christmas, um, be careful. This is an aside, but be careful not to put your hope on anybody too much. Okay, uh, during this time, church, um, don't put your hope in me or in whoever the future senior pastor is going to be of this church. Okay, whether it's the wannabe pastor here or someone else, don't do that because humans are sinful and we're going to disappoint. Okay. Put your hope in Jesus. You may be facing some difficult circumstances. And I know in a room this size, there is a lot of hardship represented. Um, some of us face pressure in our jobs. You may be in a, a thankless job you don't even like, but you're stuck. And it's just day in and day out. Some of you are, are, are suffering from separation from people that you love. Uh, people who have, have died and gone to be with the Lord, or, or even, even people you love now, but because of work reasons, they're not with you all the time like you'd like. Financial pressure, hard marriages, uh, sickness, even death. And frankly, we're all dying. We're just all on that road, right? All of us, you're dying from the day that you were born. These are real challenges that we face. So remember this. Christ Jesus died for you 
He rose again for you, and therefore all of the promises of God are yes in Him. So look up from the tough circumstances of life, look to Jesus, and hold fast to His promises. The psalmist cried out, Why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. Number two, be an agent of hope this Christmas. Um, This Christmas, make a decision that you're going to be one who brings hope to other people. I was really excited yesterday and frankly very proud of our church yesterday at Wildwood. Um, Many of you showed up to give people hope. Whether you were serving meals or acting out a nativity or talking to people, loving on them, you were giving them hope. And that's what we've been designed to do, to be hope spreaders. Um, I've got a, an opportunity um, that I thought I just mentioned that just kind of came up over the weekend. Uh, if, if any of you would like to come and, and join me on Monday night, so tomorrow night, kind of last minute here, to come and sing some Christmas carols at Broad River Prison. Okay, there's a group of churches gathering together, and we've been asked, Chaplain Lennon sent me an email yesterday saying, hey, if if you'd like to round up a posse from Rocky Bayou to come and sing, um, we need to meet up. We can meet here at 4.15, actually meet at 4, and we'll leave at 4.15, and at the jail at Broad Broad River, not Broad River, I said that wrong, Crestview Prison, that was the one in South Carolina I used to go to, Broad River, don't go there. (laughs) Um, That's maximum security, so that's pretty heavy duty. Um, Actually, I, I remember um, going in and, and, and a few times with my, my good friend Bob, who was there every Wednesday night. There were about 100 guys who would come together who called themselves the CIA, the Christians in Action, okay? And, um, and, and these were all killers. It was all maximum security. And I just remember singing with them, thinking, you know, every one of these guys could break my neck like a pencil, you know, with one hand. Um, one guy, I noticed, had Arabic tattoos on his fingers, you know, and I noticed he was reading an Arabic Bible, and, and turns out the guy was from Lebanon, this was unscripted by the way, um, and, 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 uh, and afterwards he asked me, he was really praying and really singing, and afterwards he says, hey, I love what you're doing over there in Central Asia, when I get out of here, can I come and join your team? And I was a little nervous, um, he had killed people on three different continents, okay, um, and thankfully, Bob kind of whispered in my ear, don't worry about him. He's got like 10 life sentences. He's not getting, so, you know, I was able to kind of give him a little hope, <laughs> um, maybe a little false hope. But um, come and help give hope to the guys and the ladies at Crestview, Okaloosa County Jail. That's where we're going. Up in Crestview, okay? Um, 4.15, we'll meet here, or 4 o'clock, and we'll leave here at 4.15. Um, and, and the plan is to arrive there at 4.45 and to sing, I think, from about 5.30 to 6.30, maybe 6.45, something like that. So you can still get home for a late dinner. And just to go and sing and give hope to these folks in jail. So if you'd like to come and join me, uh, please do let me know. I've got I to gotta let Chapel and Linda know we've got enough people. So right afterward, just come tell me that you're in or give me a call or a text. 615-944-4183. Um, this is my phone number. That might have been a mistake to just do that. 615-944-4183. So we need about 10 people at least, if possible. So be a hope giver this, this Christmas. John Piper said this. He said, hope is the birthplace of Christian self-sacrificing love. That's because... We let God take care of us, and we're not preoccupied with having to work to take care of ourselves. We say, Lord, I just want to be there for other people tomorrow because you're going to be there for me. If we don't have the hope of Christ is for us, if that's not our hope, then we're going to be engaged in self-preservation and self-enhancement. But if we let ourselves be taken care of by God for the future, whether five minutes or five centuries from now, then we can be free to love others. There's a freedom in that. Then God's glory will shine more clearly because that's how he becomes visible, through the hope that is in us. So number three, finally, 
Um, Christian, I just want to encourage you to know him this Christmas. The, the whole point of the incarnation was for God to reveal himself to us, to know us, so that we can know him. And you might feel right now that he's far away, okay, or that you're far from him. That could be because of sin, okay? That could be just a dry time in, in your life as a, as a Christian. Or maybe you're here and you don't even know him. Um, maybe you've never truly, in your heart, repented from your sin and trusted in, in, in this Jesus Christ, who isn't just a baby, okay? He's the, the Lord of the universe who's coming back to make all things right. Let me encourage you this morning to open up your heart to him and to know him. And the, his letter to the church in Laodicea, Jesus said this. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's interested in you, in knowing you. If anyone hears my voice and opens a door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. So, Christian, today Jesus stands at your heart's door, knocking. Open it up, let him in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 